the Workforce Committee have put their differences aside and worked through a very bipartisan process to develop an exceptional piece of legislation. I'd like to thank members and their staffs for these efforts, and I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join with us in supporting this positive legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time is reserved. Gentleman from California. I yield, uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself five minutes. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise uh, today in support of the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act, and I want to thank the chairman of the committee, Mr. Klein, and the subcommittee chair, uh, Mr. Hunter, for all of their, uh, their cooperation and support in working with the minority on this side of the aisle uh, on, this, uh, on this legislation. Both sides of the aisle have strong proponents of this, uh, of this legislation and of the charter school movement in this, uh, in this country. This legislation, because of that cooperation, is the first bipartisan piece of reauthorization of the Elementary Secondary Education Act. It passed the Education Committee with bipartisan support, and I'm hopeful that it will receive similar support from the full Congress. This, this country is facing a severe education crisis. Our schools are simply not meeting the educational needs of our students, and it is a threat to our global competitiveness and to our economic security. Charter schools began 20 years ago as a laboratory for innovation and to help tackle the stagnant educa education system at that time and to give options to parents who felt helpless. These schools are, have often become the mythbusters of what's possible in the, for a demographic of children that have all too often been written off. Currently, they serve about 4% of all public school students. In urban areas, that number is much higher. Charter schools are not a silver bullet and won't solve all of the education challenges, but they have become an important part of the education system, and we need to update the law to reflect the reality. The Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act encourages effective reforms that will help transform schools and communities. First, this bill makes significant improvements in the existing charter school program and addresses issues that we've heard from education advocates across the country. It rightfully returns charter schools to their original purpose of public schools that identify and share innovative practices and lead to improvements in academic achievement for all public schools. It requires the charters be brought back into the traditional public school system as opposed to running in a parallel system. And it requires charters to actually serve all student populations and therefore provide more parents with real choices. Second, this bill prioritizes accountability. It puts student achievement first, and it's a greater increases in accountability in charter school authorizers and greater oversight by, by state education authorities. Third, the bill addresses a reoccurring problem in charter schools, which is a lack of service to students with disabilities and English, learning, English language learners. This, this bill is we dramatically improve the access for unserved, underserved populations. We require better recruitment and enrollment practices for underserved populations. Lastly, the bill rightly focuses on our students and what they need to succeed. In many states, high-performing charter schools are a great option for some students. These schools are, are closing the achievement gap and shattering low expectations that have stood in the way of student success. Charter schools have been on the forefront of bold ideas and innovation in education. They've shown and given the, given the right tools all students can achieve at high levels. We're learning from great charter schools about what works for students and what students need to be able to compete in the global economy. Replicating this success will help our students, our communities, and our economy. With this legislation, we can help ensure that the positive reforms happening in some charter schools will happen at all charter schools, and we can help ensure that best practices are shared throughout that school district. But this legislation is only one piece of education reform puzzle. Unfortunately, we are not taking up the whole Elementary Secondary Education Act, but just one part. This country is in the midst of the most dynamic education reform atmosphere that I have seen in my tenure in Congress. The reauthorization of the Elementary Secondary Education Act presents an opportunity to take hold of that momentum and bring it to our education system for the future. The bill before us today is good, but we need to do much more. It will be a tremendous disservice for our children if our, and our country if we do not provide relief for schools who are struggling under the outdated law. This relief should come in the form of full comprehensive reauthorization of ESEA. To do that, we must take, take on all of the real issues facing our schools, not just charters. We need to address accountability, data, data assessments, and, assessments and, and college and career-ready standards and modernizing the teaching profession. And we all have to, uh, to hold true to the reason that why the federal government has a role in education in the first place, to ensure that equal opportunity of every student in the country to, to access to a great education. We know that, 
what it will take to fix our schools. It isn't a mystery, but accomplishing that goal isn't easy. It takes real political will to overcome the ideology and to stay focused on what's best for kids. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this legislation. I hope that we can get much more comprehensive reauthorization of ESEA in the near future, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'm very pleased to yield five minutes to the uh, gentleman from California, the chair of the K-12 subcommittee, uh, Mr. Hunter. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to extend my appreciation to Chairman Klein for his leadership and tireless work toward improving the quality of education for America's children, as well as Ranking Member Kildee, my colleague on the subcommittee, and full committee Ranking Member Miller, as, were, as well as Jared Paulus from Colorado, who's not even on this full committee, but was very supportive of this legislation. The Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act is a bill that will have a direct impact on our nation's children. Expanding access to high-performing performance charter schools has, a, has the potential to make a world of difference for students across the nation, simply by adding a much-needed layer of choice and competition that is good for the entire school system, not just charters. Unlike traditional public schools, the charter school model is not limited by a one-size-fits-all approach. Instead, these institutions enjoy increased freedom from state and local rules and regulations in exchange for greater accountability. Also, the flexibility afforded to charter schools allows teachers and school administrators to adjust schedules and coursework to better serve a wide range of students in their individual communities, including disadvantaged students. For example, a Louisiana charter school established in the wake of Hurricane Katrina enrolled many students who had fallen significantly behind other students their age after the disaster forced them to miss a full year of school. In spite of these difficult circumstances, dedicated teachers tailored groundbreaking coursework to meet the needs of these students. Student achievement levels soared and this charter school is now the third most successful high school in New Orleans. Improved academic achievement in even the most troubled school districts is one reason why charter schools are in such high demand. With more than 400,000 students across the nation on wait lists, even so, many states have imposed arbitrary caps on the total number of charter schools permitted, as well as the total number of students allowed to attend these schools. These provisions unnecessarily stifle parental choice and keep students trapped in low-performing schools. Charter schools also have difficulty securing adequate funding. Current law awards funding for the establishment of new charter schools, but does not support funds for replication, updates, or improvements. As a result, charter schools with a proven record of high student achievement may be unable to secure funding to replicate its educational model in a new community. The Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act will help put an end to these barriers to charter school growth by streamlining and modernizing the federal charter schools program. The law will facilitate the ability of states to access funding for the expansion and replication of the best charter schools through the simplification of the federal grant program. Additionally, the legislation incentivizes charter school development by offering priority grant funding to states that remove arbitrary caps on charter school growth. Charter schools provide an opportunity for students who might otherwise spend their formative years stuck in subpar classrooms. We cannot allow arbitrary measures or partisan differences to stand in the way of providing all children access to a high-quality education. I strongly encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to unite in support of a better future for the nation's students and vote yes on the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. This is Mr. Hinojosa. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my strong support for H.R. 2218, the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act. This bill strengthens our nation's charter schools by making much needed improvements to current law. And I commend Chairman John Klein and Ranking Member George Miller of the Education and Workforce Committee for their leadership on this issue. As ranking member of Subcommittee on Higher Education, I want to help K through 12 schools to give us college ready high school graduates and to send them to colleges or four year universities. That's why I support 2218. In regard to accessibility, this bill helps to ensure that English language learners and students with disabilities have opportunity to attend and excel in high school charter schools. Under this proposal, Charter schools 
charter school authorizers must ensure that charter schools comply with the civil rights as well as Individuals with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act and monitor the schools in recruiting, enrolling, and meeting the needs of students with disabilities and English language learners. I am pleased that the manager's amendment to H.R. 2218 requires authorizers to ensure that charter schools solicit and consider input from parents and community members on the implementation and operation of charter schools. This bill prioritizes high-quality charter schools by adding a new definition for high-quality charter schools and providing priority consideration for states with high-quality charter schools. This bill encourages states to set higher expectations for our nation's charter schools. This legislation improves charter authorizing H.R. 2218, ensures that authorizers within the state monitor the performance of charter schools and require charter schools to conduct and publicly report financial audits. In my congressional district, the idea of public schools may I have 30 more seconds. I yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. A ne the idea of public high schools, a network of high quality public charter schools have done a terrific job of preparing minorities, English language learners, and students with disabilities for college and careers. Currently, Idea Public Schools operate 20 schools in 10 communities in the Rio Grande Valley. This year, all the Idea Public Schools were rated exemplary, the highest district rating issued by the Texas Education Agency and our Idea College Preparatory School in Donna, Texas, has been recognized as one of the very best high schools in the nation. In fact, 100% of Idea Public School graduates are enrolled in a community college or university. I urge my colleagues to, on both sides of the aisle to support H.R. 2218. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I yield four minutes to the uh, gentleman from Tennessee, a member of the committee, the chairman of the HELP subcommittee, Mr. Rowe, Dr. Gen Rowe. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for four minutes. I thank the chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act. It's heartening to see strong bipartisan support for a bill that will do a lot of good for America's children. A high-quality education should be the birthright of every American child. As a society, we must ensure that they have the, to the tools needed to chase their dreams and to succeed in an increasingly competitive global marketplace. A child growing up in Cock County, Tennessee today will someday compete with jobs for young people in China, India, and around the world. It's our duty to prepare our children and this great country for this reality. Sadly, we're falling short in this responsibility. While many of our traditional public schools are outstanding, others leave students falling through the cracks. That's why an increasing number of parents are turning to charter schools to educate their children. But the supply has been unable to keep up with the demand. An estimated 420,000 students are on the waiting list to be admitted to charter schools. It's heartbreaking to know that the trajectory of these children's lives will be in no small part determined by a lottery. We can and must do better. H.R. 2218 will help more students gain access to a quality education facilitating the development of high-performing charter schools. It reauthorizes the charter school program, which provides startup grants to help charter schools open the doors, buy classroom materials, and uh, teach new students. The bill also encourages states to support the development and expansion of charter schools while ensuring an emphasis on quality and innovation. The best educational system is the one in which parents, teachers, and local school boards collaborate to set the agenda, not Washington, D.C. This bill puts more power in the hands of those who know our children best and their needs best. Charter schools are not a silver bullet, but they offer a way out for students who otherwise would be trapped in a failing school. Every charter school that is supported through this program is one more choice a parent will have to ensure their children's future success. I thank my colleagues for their bipartisan support, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from California. I yield uh, three minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Woolsey, a member of the committee. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak on H.R. 2218, the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act. Uh, during my first visit 
to a charter school. Years ago, when charter schools were first on the horizon, I was so impressed. I was impressed with the small class sizes. I was impressed with the level of parental involvement and the individualized learning programs. Uh, in fact, when I left the, the, the school, I was actually teary. I mean, I was overcome because I wanted every single child in the United States of America to have this same rich e educational experience. S all charter schools aren't quite that successful, and all public schools aren't failing. But charter schools were created to develop best practices and innovative learning methods. Uh, and that if they were successful, those methods could be brought back and used in all public schools. While some charter schools have found new ways to promote academic achievement, public schools have yet to benefit from this, in, in other pre public schools have yet to uh, benefit from this investment. This bill will return charter schools to their original mission by helping improve the public school system and ensuring that charters no longer operate in isolation without strict accountability. For many years, uh, I've been concerned that charter schools using taxpayer dollars would function at the expense of public schools instead of complementing them. For instance, without reform, the most talented and motivated students could simply go to the charter schools while public schools would be left with the most challenging situations, especially students with disabilities, students with English uh, learning language learners, and uh, students who come from broken homes and are uh, having a hard time just keeping up in general. And that was totally contrary to the intent of the charter school movement. Uh, it would re weaken rather than strengthen our public school systems. So to address this problem, this bill stood up. And in a very bipartisan way, the, our committee uh, put together a bill that we have here on the House floor that requires charter schools to adopt practices that promote inclusion that allow for increased enrollment of students with disabilities and lim limited English skills, and provide an information sharing uh, system regarding systems programs. There are many other necessary uh, reforms included in H.R. 2218, and they'll all ensure charter schools fill their original purpose. With these reforms, charter schools will play the constructive role in our education system that they were designed to play. And I thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, his time has expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, the chair of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee, Mr. Wahlberg. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee leadership for bringing this bill forward, H.R. 2218. I urge uh, support of my colleagues. Uh, in the Northwest Ordinance, and uh, the same language in that ordinance, as well as what was then put into many of our state constitutions, it says this, it says, Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. I believe this bill, H.R. 2218, does just that. Uh, it's a simple bill. It, uh, it pr promotes a charter school program that accomplishes three goals. Those being one, to provide parents greater options for their children's education. Two, consolidating education programs and reducing the authorization level. And three, supporting the development of high quality charter schools. That's what we're about in education. That's what we ought to be concerned with. Uh, this bill accomplishes our goal of modernizing and streamlining the program by consolidating the current programs to one program and one authorization line. The resultant savings still affords the taxpayer, the parent, and the educator with even more opportunity for growth of proven charter school models and new innovative charter schools. The bill ensures that charter schools and charter school authorizers reach out to parents to serve students who can benefit from these schools. The legislation supports quality initiatives in the authorizing world without putting any new mandates on the schools. 
The legislation has broad support, including a community that includes the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, National Alliance of Public Charter Schools, Texas Charter School Association, Chiefs for Change, the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, just to name a few. Charter schools were created in, in Michigan, my state, 15 years ago, and since that time nothing but proven educational success has taken place with children in, in tough school districts before now receiving education that is promoting success for them and their future posterity uh, in an education opportunity that expands in the real world experience. For that region and many others, I urge the support of H.R. 2218 as a uh, proposal that does exactly what our Northwest Ordinance says. It encourages schools and the means of education for quality students and future uh, uh, people that will work in our system. I thank the speaker. Gentleman from California. I yield three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my friend for yielding. In the earliest days of our republic, our prosperity came from our abundant natural resources. Then in later days, our prosperity came from the fact that we were bordered by two vast oceans into our east and west, which gave us an isolated domestic market. In the days after the Second World War, our prosperity was grounded on the fact that we were the sole remaining industrial power untouched by the Second World War, relatively speaking. All of those advantages, relatively speaking, are gone. And the way we're going to be prosperous today and in the future is by having the best educated, best motivated workforce anywhere in the world. We're not going to have that best educated and best motivated workforce without a high quality education for every child in America. I see this bill as a step in that direction by uh, enriching and making more accountable the charter school movement in our country. Make no mistake about it, all charter schools are not perfect. Uh, many charter schools, frankly, are very troubled. But the charter school movement has been a positive uh, step forward for our country. This bill adds accountability to that movement and adds new resources I think are welcome. I would echo the words of uh, Ranking Member Miller and note that 90% of children in America's schools are in public schools. And the principal legislative action we have on those public schools is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I know that the chairman of the committee has worked very diligently to prepare the committee for the work we could do on that. And I'm hopeful that we can have the same kind of cooperative effort for the ESEA reauthorization as we have for this charter school bill. There is much more to do, but today is a good first step. I urge a yes vote and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I yield three minutes to the uh, gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Uh, Mr. Speaker, first let me uh, thank Representative Hunter and Chairman Klein and Ranking Member Miller and others for their hard work and leadership on this legislation. I rise today as a co-sponsor of H.R. 2218, the Empowering Patients Through Quality Charter Schools Act. Where American education was once a world leader, over the past few decades we are losing our advantage. The Empowering Patients Through Quality Charter Schools Act will facilitate the development and replication of high-performing charter schools that will help America regain its stature as a leader in educating its citizens. Charter schools are created through a contract with local education providers that allow flexibility and innovation in educating our children while maintaining the same requirements and accountability of traditional public schools. Charter schools are able to bring innovation and special programming into the curriculum that is uniquely tailored to the needs of their specific student population. This not only allows choice for parents whose children may be better suited for this kind of flexibility, but also can inspire progress in traditional schools by raising the bar and creating greater transparency. By increasing funding opportunities for the replication of successful charter schools and, fa and facilities assistance, H.R. 2218 encourages states to invest in charter schools. Further, H.R. 2218 supports the evaluation of the impact of charter schools on their students, faculty, parents, and communities to ensure that high-quality education is available for every child 
and parents can choose the correct venue for their child's education. In my district in Evansville, Indiana, Signature School was ranked the top high school in the Midwest and the number three charter school in the country by the Washington Post. These rankings were based on data that indicate how well a school prepares its students for college based on advanced placement tests or in international baccalaureate completions. Signature School is an example of a high-performing charter school that this legislation aims to replicate. Replicating schools like Signature School that have a proven history for effectively preparing our children for college is not only in the best interest of students and parents, but also in the best interest of the economy. By increasing the number of students that are college ready, we build more education and a more educated generation, more prepared to take on the complex jobs in healthcare, engineering, science, technology, and others that future industries will demand. With an unemployment rate near 9%, educating our students is critical. By increasing our students' access to high-quality charter schools, H.R. 2218 will prepare our children for the high-tech jobs of the future. This is essential if we are to maintain our competitiveness in a global economy. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. I yield the three minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for two minutes. The intellectual architect of all this. <laughs> I, I, th I thank the uh, gentleman from California and the gentleman from, from Minnesota. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of, of good in, in public education today. When we look across our country, uh, just as we see examples of what, what doesn't work, uh, dropout factories, schools where kids are falling further and further behind uh, each year, uh, schools that have uh, are unsafe learning environments for their kids, just as we have that. We also have examples of what works, what works with our most at-risk populations in this country, showing that every student in this country can learn and can achieve given the right uh, opportunity in the right school environment. Now, charter schools aren't the silver bullet or the solution, but they are a tool. Uh, a tool in the arsenal of school districts and states to address the learning needs of all students. Nationally, there's over 5,000 charter schools uh, representing just over 5% of all public schools uh, in, in the country. Many of those charter schools couldn't have gotten off the ground without the federal startup grants that this bill reauthorizes. Importantly, again, because we have examples of what this works, this bill for the first time allows states to use the money to expand and replicate learning models that work. Uh, I point to one in Colorado, the Ricardo Flores Magon Academy. 93% free and reduced lunch, 86% English language learners, and yet they scored far above the state average on the past three years, 95 to 100% proficient in math, uh, and about 20% higher than the state average score, a state average score that includes wealthy suburban uh, districts as well. Yes, these students can learn, and schools like Ricardo Flores Magon Academy will now, under this new authorization, have access to expansion and replication money. So when models work, whether that's a model like KIPP nationally that has successfully serves some of our most at-risk communities or whether it's uh, grassroots efforts across our country, they will be able to access resources to serve more students and grow or to open up additional uh, branches of the same school. Uh, national, state, and local research consistently show that, yes, not all charter schools work. Some underperform other public schools. Some perform at the same level, and some do better. And what we do with this bill is we provide for best practices nationally. We've learned a lot in the last 10 years with regards to charter schools. Uh, we now have some best practices in this bill, like removing uh, caps on the number of charter schools and districts through the manager's amendment, ensuring that charter schools can participate in food services uh, as well as transportation services as districts. And I want to point out the importance of transportation because to make choice meaningful, to add uh, the emphasis to choice, uh, you have to have transportation options to get the most at-risk kids to school, uh, otherwise choice uh, is simply an empty promise. By focusing federal investments, as H.R. 2218 does, it ensures that we maximize the impact of our limited federal resources on improving student achievement and reducing the learning gap across the country. To succeed as a nation, we need to do a better job with our human capital, preparing the next generation of Americans for the next generation of jobs, and this bill will be an important tool in that arsenal. I strongly support this bill and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, can I inquire as to the time remaining on each side?
The gentleman from Minnesota has remaining 16 minutes. The gentleman from California has remaining 15 minutes. It's my understanding that the gentleman from California has several more speakers. No more speakers? They're here in spirit. Uh, <laughs> they're, not, they're not here in person, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm, I'm prepared to reserve and let you uh, call on the speakers. If, if not, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'll reserve. I think yes. I think I think the gentleman. Uh, I had one or two other speakers. We've we've uh, put out a call to them, but they have not responded. I'll see if we can maybe fit them in on the manager's uh, amendment if they if they wanted wanted to speak, because uh, I'll be very brief on the manager's amendment on on this side. So uh, let me let me just close by uh, again thanking uh, everyone on the. Uh, uh, on the committee for their uh, their support, and I certainly want to thank uh, the staff on the, this side, on both sides of the aisle, but particularly the staff on this side of the aisle for, for helping me with this uh, with this legislation and the members of our committee. I want to recognize Jamie Fastow and, and Ruth Friedman, Kara Machon, and and uh, Laura, Laura Shifter, uh, Daniel Brown, Megan O'Reilly, and and Adam uh, Schaefer. Uh, Tell Jody we got to redo this. Uh, <laughs> uh, for all of their uh, their contributions to uh, this successful bipartisan effort, and finally, I'd just like to say this: as, as many speakers have said, uh, all charter schools aren't perfect. This isn't the silver bullet, but what we hope to be able to do is 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 to really. Uh, continue to, to, to grow the entrepreneurial spirit of people, young people uh, uh, across the board looking at our education system, thinking how it can be done better, what, what are the best practices, what are the indicators of successful schools, successful learning environment, successful teaching environments for teachers, for students, and focusing on the academic achievement and the benefits uh, to the students. And then to be able to share those models across the charter school spectrum, across Across the, across the traditional public school spectrum so that all of us uh, can, can learn and benefit from that and most importantly so we can create those environments where, where America's children will have the opportunity to, ha to have access to a first-class education that will serve them uh, the rest of their lives. I believe that that effort is facilitated by the charter school movement. I believe that this legislation is a substantial improvement on the original authorization for charter schools to participate in this, uh, in this area, and I look forward to the passage of this legislation. And with that, I have danced as long as I can. I yield back the uh, balance of our time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself the remainder of my time. I want to add uh, my thanks to those of uh, Ranking Member Miller, to the staff on both sides, to the members of the committee on both sides, and to our colleagues not on the committee like Mr. Polis for their uh, input and, and help in this legislation. Now, all of us were elected to Congress with a promise to enact laws that will make this country a better place for our children and our grandchildren. And this starts with ensuring that every child has access to a quality education. For many students and their parents, charter schools are a beacon of hope, and in some cases, the only beacon of hope. They symbolize opportunity, choice, and educational excellence, and it is past time to ensure more families and communities across the United States have access to these groundbreaking institutions. By approving the Empowering Parents of Quality Charter Schools Act today, we can help put more students on the path to a successful future. I urge my colleagues to put differences aside and join together in supporting this legislation for the sake of those students trapped in underperforming schools across America. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. All time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the amendment in the nature of a substitute printed in the bill shall be considered as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule and shall be considered read. No amendment to the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those printed in Part A of House Report 112-200. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division uh, of the question. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 1, printed in Part A of House Report 112-200. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. 
Amendment number one, printed in Part A of House Report number 112-200, offered by Mr. Klein of Minnesota. Pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Klein, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of this manager's amendment uh, offered by myself and Mr. Miller. Uh, in all our goals for an improved education system, one stands above the rest, ensuring students have access to a quality education. My colleagues and I firmly believe supporting the growth of high-performing charter schools will help us reach that goal. Charter schools epitomize choice and flexibility in education and represent an efficient way school districts can transform an underperforming traditional public school into a dynamic learning institution. Thanks to the additional autonomy afforded to these institutions, charter schools have become renowned for their ability to effectively meet the needs of a unique student population. A great case study of the adaptability of charters is Lock High School, located in the tough south central area of Los Angeles. Students in this area face a multitude of challenges from gang violence to poverty to troubled homes. Lock High School had some of the lowest test scores and highest dropout rates in the country. Only roughly 5% of its students went on to four-year colleges and universities. In 2007, the LA Unified School District agreed to transform Lock High School into a public charter school. Charter school officials instituted broad changes to the school, such as improved facilities, new teachers, parental volunteer hours, uniforms, and strict disciplinary measures. And as a result, attendance rates have increased to 90 percent, a real success story. Stories of charter schools that inspire success in students, no matter the circumstance, exist beyond Locke High School. These institutions have benefited children and communities in cities across the United States. Unfortunately, charter schools are not growing as they should. This act will facilitate the development of high-performing charter schools by consolidating federal funding streams, incentivizing states to support the development and expansion of these institutions, and evaluating the benefits these schools offer to students and their families. However, as my colleagues and I continue to work together on this legislation, we realized even more could be done to help charter schools assist a variety of students, including those most at risk. The accomplishments of a charter school like Locke High School should be encouraged and supported. That's why we've developed language in the manager's amendment that would offer incentives to states that use charter schools to reach out to special populations such as at-risk students. Additionally, members on both sides of the aisle decided steps must be taken to help federal charter school program grants remain on a sustainable path. The manager's amendment directs the Secretary of Education to undertake proper planning efforts to ensure sufficient new grants can be awarded annually to the best applicants. As we work to ensure all students have access to a quality education, this act is a step in the right direction. Mr. Chairman, the manager's amendment makes common sense adjustments to improve the underlying legislation, and I urge my colleagues to lend their support. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask uh, uh, to claim the time in opposition, although I'm not in opposition to the, the manager's amendment. That objection, gentleman, is recognized for five I minutes. Think, I thank the gentleman. I'll be, I'll be brief here because I want to yield to, to Mr. Pauls, but I want to point out that the, uh, the manager's amendment, again, uh, was a lot of hard work by the, uh, by the staff to put together the various ideas from the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle, but I think they did a, they've done a spectacular job, and, and the chairman and myself both support this, uh, this legislation. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, supportive of the efforts in the, in the manager's amendment to make sure that uh, parent and community input uh, is, is a priority in the in implementation of the charter school improvement uh, and the operation of those, of those charter schools. And we require that uh, as, as you consider the, uh, the, the, the beginning of a, of a charter school uh, that you take into consideration and the state entities take into consideration the input of parents uh, and, the, uh, and the community. I think this this is very important. We know that there are many, many parents that want to be involved in creating charter schools, sustaining a charter school, uh, thinking about what they want to do with the schools in their, uh, in, their, uh, in their neighborhood. I think this is an important component that I hope to see uh, in the reauthorization of ESEA, that more consideration is given to community and to parents about how we turn schools around so that they have some skin in the game, they have some interest in the game, and they have a stake in the, uh, in the outcome of, of that. And the manager amendment also requires that each charter school in the state make publicly available information on the educational program, the student support services, teachers, 
and annual performance and enrollment data for all students by the subgroups. And it strengthens, it strengthens the application process that includes application and description of how schools will consider the transportation needs of their students and also how, how on how the schools and entities will support diverse charter school models, including those serving rural areas. And with that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Polis to talk about the replication of, of uh, high quality uh, charters. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, I thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd, I'd, um, this process really demonstrates uh, strong bipartisan leadership and a commitment to our nation's children uh, from both uh, Chairman Klein and, and Ranking, Miller, Ranking Member Miller, as well as uh, all the members of the committee and their staff. Uh, and uh, I express uh, not only my deep appreciation, but I'm sure the deep appreciation of uh, the many millions of children that this bill will help provide additional opportunities for to, to them both. Um, this manager's amendment makes a good bill even better, um, including allowing priority for states that allow charters to have autonomous school food services. Um, it's critical charter schools are allowed to have independent food services. Many lack cafeteria space in some facilities, and uh, this amendment will prioritize states uh, that, that allow for that. We all know how important nutrition is for success. Transportation to and from charter schools is also critical. Uh, the bill uh, also allows for uh, the expansion for the very first time and a replication of successful charter school models. Again, uh, deferring to states uh, in that regard. Previously, these monies were only eligible for the establishment of innovative new charter schools, a worthy goal and one that is preserved under this bill as well. But we are now 10 years later uh, down the road. Uh, we know a little bit about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, based on that, the bill and the manager's amendment, A, up the ante on the best practices for the states in terms of being good authorizers, and B, allow some of the funds to be used to expand and replicate proven success, uh, as well as preserving some for the continued innovation, which is also necessary to drive our education system forward. Um, this manager's amendment also supports dropout prevention and recovery and rural needs, figuring out how uh, charter schools can fit in the context of rural and smaller school districts uh, has also been an important learning curve over the last 10 years and this bill uh, and the manager's amendment incorporate uh, some of the very best thinking in that regard in terms of uh, making sure that states have plans to ensure uh, the charter schools can also benefit uh, rural areas. Uh, this bipartisan amendment uh, exemplifies the great work uh, of the committee leadership overall in the bill uh, and truly does approve upon the base bill. Uh, and I'm very proud to be uh, strongly supportive of the manager's amendment as well as the underlying bill. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. I yield back. The gentleman from California Excuse yields me. back. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Question. question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Minnesota. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number two, printed in part A of House Report 112-200. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. <clears throat> amendment number two, printed in part A of House Report number 112-200, offered by Mrs. Davis of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Davis, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment simply stresses the need to constantly find ways to improve and find innovative ways to teach our students in the public education system. Given the state of the economy, we need to encourage economic and job growth from every angle. We need to do whatever is possible to compete in the global economy. The best way to stay on the cutting edge is to build a workforce that can compete against the best and the brightest in the world. We need schools to find new and innovative ways to teach our students, particularly in the key subjects of math, science, and engineering. One example of an innovative school is the High Tech High Charter School in San Diego, which has the goal of bringing highly skilled employees into the workforce. With the support of technology companies such as Qualcomm and Microsoft, High Tech High has taken innovation in its curriculum to a new level. Since 2003, the result has been that 100% of High Tech High's graduates have gone on to attend college at such universities as NYU, MIT, and Yale. High Tech High has successfully found innovative ways to teach innovation. And what does innovation in education mean? 
It means teachers and principals who find ways to inspire and get students excited to learn. It can mean teaching students and children how to think, how to work together, how to think across disciplines, and most importantly, how to act on their knowledge. It will take innovation to meet these goals to consistently improve instruction in the classroom. Steve Jobs, as we know, led Apple to become one of the largest and most successful technology companies in history. His visions led to such products as the iPod, the Mac computer, and recently the iPad. Mr. Jobs once said, Apple's success is not just about how much money it invests in research and development. It's about the people and creative vision. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it, Mr. Jobs told Fortune magazine in 1998. People, Mr. Speaker, people is the key word. With better and more innovative schools, we will have more creative people entering our workforce. Unfortunately, the World Economic Forum just announced that the United States dropped to fifth place in the world's most competitive economies beyond nations, behind nations, such as Switzerland and Singapore. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's the wrong direction, and we need to turn it around. If America is going to reach its potential, we need schools that cultivate entrepreneurs and visionaries. We need more companies, such as Apple, that can compete globally. Please join me in stressing the need to support innovation, beginning with our approach to education. I applaud the efforts of our bipartisan team here that's worked so hard on this underlying bill and the amendments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I rise to claim time in opposition to the amendment, though I do not intend to oppose it. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is entirely consistent with the underlying purpose of the charter school movement. It improves the bill. I support the amendment and yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I rise in, in support of this, uh, this legislation. I think one of the intents of, the, of this bill and hopefully in our reforms of the, uh, of the Elementary Secondary Education Act is to keep our eye on global competition and understand that we must prepare today's students for tomorrow's global economy and the global competition that that, uh, that, that suggests. And I uh, strongly support and have long conversations uh, with the gentlewoman on this amendment and uh, agree to it. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number three, printed in part A of House Report 112-200. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in part A of House Report number 112-200 offered by Mr. Paulson of Minnesota. Pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Paulson, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Sh uh, Chairman and Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today in support of the underlying bill, H.R. 2218, the Empowering Parents Through Charter Schools Act, and to offer this amendment that will give American communities to succeed. My amendment will make it easier for successful charter schools to replicate and expand in a timely manner because by giving these schools the ability to receive an expansion grant after three years rather than the current five years, they will be able to grow and offer quality education to even, the, to even more students and provide expanded choices to parents in a shorter amount of time. So this amendment will also strengthen the bill by continuing to break down barriers to help quality charter schools grow to meet their staggering demand. Currently, Mr. Speaker, an estimated 420,000 students across the country are being kept on waiting lists to attend the charter school of their choice. We should be giving these students more opportunities to attend and learn and be successful. My home state of Minnesota has seen tremendous success because we've been a pioneer in expanding educational options and choice. In 1991, we were the first state in Minnesota to pass a charter school law and we now have 149 registered charter schools with over 35,000 students attending them. Today, over 40 students now and the District of Columbia have established charter school laws of their own. I support the underlying bill, which was crafted bipartisanly, encourages states to support the development of charter schools. It streamlines funds to reduce administrative burdens and improve 
funding opportunities for the replication of successful charter schools and facilities assistance. It also supports an evaluation of a school's impact on students, families, and communities while encouraging the best practices sharing ideas between charters and traditional public schools. There's no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that charter schools are a prime example of where innovative education methods are constantly at work, and this bill will give our schools the ability to do even more for our children. We all know that these charter schools consistently rank as top performers among the U.S. Department of Education's Blue Ribbon Schools and multiple national rankings of the best high schools in America. So it's no surprise that the public support and demand for these charter schools is steadily increasing. So, Mr. Speaker, the legislation recognizes that the opportunity to enhance the uh, empowerment of parents uh, should go forward, allowing them to play that active role in their child's education. And this amendment will give the most successful schools the ability to grow and offer even more quality education options to more parents and students. And I want to thank the Chairman, Cl my, uh, Chairman Klein uh, for his leadership, the ranking member from California for his leadership, and I also want to thank Representative Paulus uh, for co-sponsoring this amendment and for his leadership and his true advocacy, his steadfast advocacy for expansion of school choice and opportunities uh, across the country. I yield back, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Colorado. Uh, I rise to claim time in opposition, though I'm not opposed to the amendment. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm proud to bring forward this bipartisan amendment with Mr. Paulson to a bipartisan bill. Uh, and let me express why uh, it's important. Um, to delay uh, the expansion of a successful charter school uh, for five years and prevent states from having the flexibility to deploy these resources after three proven years only consigns uh, more kids to failure and lack of opportunity. Uh, it's an important amendment because it provides flexibility for states and charter schools to expand what works. And one year could be an aberration, two years of proven success could be lucky, but three years of success is hard to dispute. Uh, and when a school has three years of, of proven success, uh, to make it wait five full years before it's eligible to expand uh, with federal money uh, only consigns all of those students who would have been served, who otherwise reside on the waiting list uh, and are forced to attend schools that provide uh, less educational opportunity. Uh, we're, your only, we're only young once. Uh, in life. And that's why, with regard to education and improving the quality of our public schools, we all feel the fierce urgency uh, of now. When a charter school starts out, it's not possible to predict whether it'll be successful or not. And that's, in fact, the purpose of the innovation grants, uh, starting out new charter schools. With this, without this amendment, uh, charter schools that have proven success could be forced to wait five years before being able to replicate and expand a wait uh, that our nation can't afford and most of all, uh, those kids on the waiting list it can't afford. Um, this provision is especially needed for charter schools that don't use the grants for planning, which is another year before the charter school starts. Uh, so it could be one year and then three or four years, but if they don't use the, the year for a planning year, it's actually a full five-year wait uh, before the school would have access to expansion and replication resources uh, without this amendment. So I'm uh, particularly glad of Mr. Paulson's effort to bring this, uh, uh, this forward. Um, the National Activities section of the bill already reflects this. In fact, uh, the National Activities section provides funding uh, after three years of demonstrated success, but that's only 2.5% of the total funds of the bill. Most of the funds under this bill uh, are pushed to the states and allowed for the dual purpose of innovation and expansion and replication. And essentially Essentially, uh, with this bill remedies, it reflects the national activities language in saying the states have the discretion. They're actually allowed to require five years uh, of demonstrated success. I, I wouldn't encourage them to do that, but they have the flexibility uh, to do it with three years of demonstrated success to ensure that proven educational opportunities for kids can reach more kids sooner uh, under this amendment, which is why I'm, I'm proud to lend it uh, my support. Uh, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Minnesota. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just ask for adoption of this bipartisan amendment and the underlying bill and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Minnesota. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. In order to consider amendment number four printed in part A of House Report 112-200, for what purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number four printed in part A of House Report number 112-200.
offered by Mr. Lujan of New Mexico. Pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The United States has the best research facilities and educational institutions in the world, and we continue to be a leader in developing cutting-edge technology and fields spanning from re renewable energy to medicine. But our nation's competitiveness depends upon our ability to educate our students and equip them with the skills they need to succeed in the jobs of the future. The President, Congressional leadership, and business have all agreed that our nation must do better in order to compete and excel globally in science, technology, engineering and math, or STEM fields. My amendment today simply says that entities include in their application a description of how the school's program would share best practices between charter schools and other public schools, including best practices in instruction and professional development in STEM education. This amendment supports the identification of best practices and encourages opportunities for teacher training and mentoring in STEM. According to the National Center for Education St Statistics, U.S. high school seniors recently tested below the international average for 21 countries in mathematics and science. This is simply not acceptable. We must make a commitment to restore science and innovation as keys to a new American economy. We must ensure that America's students are trained to be innovators, critical thinkers, problem solvers, and prepare to become part of the workforce for the 21st century. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, yes, I would yield. For offering the amendment, thank him for yielding. I, I rise in strong support of this of this amendment. This gentleman, yield back his time. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise to claim time in opposition to the amendment, but I do not intend to oppose it. Without objection. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment simply emphasizes the importance of STEM education. It's widely recognized in the business community, the education community, and throughout America that there is a growing gap that we need to fill in STEM education. By underscoring the importance of STEM education, this uh, is helpful to the bill, and I encourage my colleagues to support it. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number five, printed in part A of House Report 112-200. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in part A of House Report number 112-200, offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Pursuant to House Resolution 392, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, one of the best practices that uh, I think we've, we've learned over the last uh, 10 years uh, is the importance of having alternative authorizing uh, agencies. And in fact, uh, 32 states uh, have created alternative authorizing agencies, including my home state of Colorado, which has a charter school institute in other states. It takes the form of vesting mayors, uh, university board of regents, or state boards of education as alternative authorizers. Um, Doing so ensures that bold ideas for charter schools brought forth by parents and grassroots community members are more likely to get a fair shot at being considered uh, if, there are, if there is an alternative authorizer uh, instead of what's already in the bill, uh, which is also should be present, which is an appeals process. An appeals process automatically sets up a kind of adversarial relationship. Uh, and we have that as well in Colorado. When I served on the State Board of Education, we heard appeals processes. So if a district turned down a charter school, it was appealed to the State Board. We could then overrule that district and force them to grant it. But it set up a very adversarial relationship. Uh, what has proven to work better in the 32 states that have it is having an alternative uh, authorizer in addition to an appeals process so that districts that simply don't want to be in the charter authorizing business or that refuse to uh, grant any charter schools or don't have uh, uh, an application process for them uh, can simply uh, allow another entity to do provide the quality oversight that's needed for a charter school in a district. One of the great evolutions of the last 10 years has been the responsibility of charter school authorizers. Um, it's not simply uh, a charter school that needs to reform. It's the authorizer, the public entity, that needs to hold that charter school responsible for the performance of its students. Uh, in my state of Colorado, 
Colorado, our Charter School Institute approved 22 charter schools serving 10,000 students in the six years that, that we've had it. Uh, that's 22 out of the about 120 charter schools uh, that exist in the state. The State University of New York, the University of Indiana and Michigan have also approved some of those states' most successful uh, charter schools. Local school boards uh, look at things in a different way sometimes. Um, they appropriately consider their district's own financial situation when voting on charter schools. But that focus sometimes interferes with their consideration of the greater good and local control, quiet, quality, viable public school choices for parents and students that address the diverse learning needs of their district. Uh, unreasonable denials by school districts can be appealed in states, and that's already one of the provisions of this. But from my own experience on the State Board of Education, I know that the appeals process is, is really less desirable for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's only reactive and only addresses the merits of whether a particular school board denial was valid or not. It's not proactive in terms of developing innovative learning models uh, and supporting the quality development and authorizing practice of charter schools. Two, appeals can address school district delays in approving charter schools. Uh, there's also a way of kind of uh, killing by delay, burying under paperwork, uh, uh, unreasonable request after unreasonable request from the school district to the founders of the charter school uh, that ultimately lead to abandonment of the, I, of the idea. Appeals are often limited in scope and criteria. Uh, and appeals are also a drain on state resources, state board of education members' time, department of education staff time, state attorney general's time. So while they have their role, uh, it it's, it's really should be a last resort and shouldn't be prioritized as a best practice. That's why I'm proposing um, to add a priority uh, for multiple charter authorizers. Again, states will be able to determine the best form that that should take. I should also point out this is very important for rural areas and small districts. Uh, it is very, very difficult if not impossible, for a small district or rural school district to be a quality authorizer. In many cases, they recognize that and would rather not be. In fact, in Colorado, most of the districts that have welcomed the state authorizer and, and, and said for the local applicants to apply to them instead of their district are districts that know that they can't engage in a meaningful approval or oversight process. By having a statewide entity, you allow some scale to the very important business of being an authorizer, a scale uh, that small and rural districts uh, lack and, and really we can empower community members in those districts with the power of school choice and charters uh, by ensuring that there is a multiple authorizer. Uh, this amendment is supported by the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools as well as uh, a very important um, and a newer entity at the national level, the National Association for Charter School Authorizers, which is actually composed of districts and state authorizing agencies, both of whom uh, have endorsed uh, this amendment. Again, it simply establishes this as a priority for funding, uh, ensuring that this best practice that uh, we've come to learn over the last decade uh, can better be reflected. Uh, and that hopefully states that haven't yet had the chance to uh, look at a way to create uh, a, uh, an alternative authorizing agency uh, will be able to learn from the states that have under this uh, and do so to ensure that charter schools get a fair hearing, prevent the adversarial outcomes that too frequently come uh, from the appeals process, and to ensure that choice is given meaning in rural school districts and small school districts. Uh, I urge support of my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Minnesota.